And welcome back once again to the Endurance Hour podcast. Back alongside Kona coach Wendy Mater. I'm Dave Erickson. This is episode 389. And we're all about answering questions from our viewers, listeners, and athletes today. This is from Scott. He said, I'm going to purchase swim paddles for the first time. Coach Wendy, any suggestions and do the sizes of matter for your hands or is it purely a matter of resistance in the swim workouts? Coach? Hey, Scott, that's a great question. And I happen to have two examples of two hand paddles that I recommend for athletes. Oh, she's got props. In my swim bag. So first of all, the size does matter. And the size, the size definitely um, creates resistance. So a smaller paddle is going to have less resistance than a, than a larger paddle. This is an example of what I would say is a size small, and it comes in different models and you know, I'm not sure what brand this is. I think it's, oh, definitely Speedo. It says Speedo on it. This is not my favorite brand, but it's it's just a paddle that I have. And then this is what I use. I use the, the large or extra large TYR hand paddles, and this creates more resistance. And these are the reasons I believe my lats are so strong when I swim, because I spend a lot of time using hand paddles. Now you want to use hand paddles because they create strength. Swimming is a, a technique strength sport. So once you develop the technique, then add the strength with paddles. And I also like to use a pull buoy when I wear the paddles um, to create that strength. And then to go faster, you start to increase your arm turnover without losing that strength. Now, when I wear these, these come in small, medium, large, and extra, extra large. I always recommend an athlete starting with a size small hand paddle, whatever brand you're going to use. The kids that I coach, they actually have a, a, a paddle called Finnis Agility Paddle. It's yellow, and you just put your thumb in a hole, and then your fingers are free. And what the paddles also do them provide strength is they correct some deficiencies you may have in your stroke. So when I wear the paddle, I never put my wrist in here. I usually have my wrist out, and I just put my finger in the hole because – if my stroke was was poor, which it's not, this would flop around. And so for mm. those swimmers who tend to extend their hand too much and point their fingers up, then the paddle's going to come off. And so you as a swimmer can diagnose some technique issues. And if I was coaching you on deck, I could see that when you're wearing the hand paddle. And I always recommend starting with a small hand paddle and making sure you do have some technique because if you have poor technique meaning if you're someone who reaches and drops their elbow wearing a hand paddle could put extra stress on your shoulders and that's not a good thing uh just for a technical thing here you have your blur feature on so when you held up your paddle it was in blur mode unless you put it directly in front of your face or take off the blur we're doing this on skype by the way so for the people who are watching this on youtube that's what happened oh okay Okay, so if you do want to use it, just put it directly in front, and then we can see it, but it was a little bit blurry. But we can see the size of the paddles for sure. Excellent. And I have those uh, Finis or Finis yellow paddles, and I, I love those because it's just your thumb in there, and it's small and compact, but it gives you mm -hmm. enough friction and resistance. And because it can wobble if you have bad form, it helps you uh, stay in the water the right way. Yeah, and it's important when you are wearing the paddles. Again, I like to wear it while I'm pulling, so I'm just working on my upper body. Then mm -hmm. um, you want to follow through on your stroke, it, you know, because when, when, it does create resistance. A lot of times, if you're an inexperienced swimmer, you cut your stroke short because it creates that resistance and you might not have that strength in your lats. So you want to make sure you mm -hmm. follow through with your stroke all the way past your hip. That's why it's important to start small. So you, you have the strength to be able to pull all the way through then to start too big where it's creating more resistance and you're not ready for that. And how often should you incorporate paddles in your swim workout? And is there like a max or can you do an entire, let's say a 3,000 yard set with the paddles? Is, that, is there the pros yeah, and cons I mean, of that? I would, again, with anything, start small and progress at incremental steps. So like someone like me, yeah, I can do as much as I want because I have the technique and I have the strength and I have just the experience, endurance. Um, for most people though, I usually will start them out with a set of maybe 1050s. Um, mm -hmm. that's a total of a 500 for someone that might be too much, kind of use it as a drill, go by, by feel. Um, but definitely start small 
and then add each workout. I like to use them a lot in my base phase of training as I'm building the endurance, I'm building strength in all the sports. And that's where I like to incorporate paddles most. And then when I get into a more race specific phase of training, I cut out the toys, meaning I use my paddles less and I increase the amount that I'm actually swimming with no fins or paddles, snorkels or pull buoys. And so I'm getting more race specific. I can see just using the paddles without really trying too hard, but using it for a technique yeah. purpose only. So just going through the motions, but not having to pull super hard. That way you get a better feel of the, of the water. And like you're saying, maybe do fifties and then alternate fifties, fifties with fifties without, or 20, probably fifties without. So you can put them off, drop them off yeah. the wall and then come back and do an easy 50 to feel the difference. Isn't that something that a lot of swim coaches will say, do it right. this way, like the drill this way and then do it normal and you'll notice the difference. Right, and most people will notice that when they take the paddles off, their arm turnover, their arm cadence will increase because they don't have that resistance through the water and they feel almost like they're spinning their wheels or they feel like they're going slower. That's normal, especially in the initial stages of using paddles, but through mm -hmm. the proper training, you can someone like me when I'm doing the proper training for my events, meaning the proper volume, the proper intensity levels, I end up not wanting to wear my paddles because I feel like it slows me down. There's a transition. There's always a transition that I notice when I'm training where I'm starting to get faster without the paddles. And so that's when I know my fitness in the water is where I want it to be leading up to a race. Got it. That reminds me of um, the how to, how to Swim Faster in 30 Days program where we got you talking to athletes on deck. This, I think it was in Boulder or Tucson. And you said, do this routine or this uh, this drill and then now do it without and notice the difference. Do you recall some of that? I do. Yeah. And that, that was reminds me. It it's like perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. And that reminds me of we also have another program. Um, swimming made easy with over 101 swim workouts. And I actually have, mm -hmm. um, 10 to 20 workouts specifically with building strength with paddles. So I have, you know, anywhere between 1500 and 5,000 meters of a set that targets use of more paddles and pulling more than other sets, because that's the phase of training for that type of program. Got it. And to, to add on top of that, I recently this past week saw a video of another coach explaining to an athlete about breathing and they put the paddle on the athlete's forehead and the athlete was trying to swim <laughs> with the paddle on their forehead. So what that was specifically working on is less head movement while they were swimming and the, the ability to turn their head to breathe without the paddle falling off their forehead. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> it's just another before. another use of the paddle. Wow. Hey, you're you are an Ironman certified coach on Training Peak still? Yes. Okay. There was a, a video, I'm gonna share the audio of it here in just a moment, of Mark Allen talking about heart rate. This is a different topic, but talking about heart rate and running and how he started off, he's gonna say it here, but he started off running when he was, you know, in the, the peak of his career, uh -huh. trying to run faster uh, throughout all of his workouts. Did you see this video too? No. And then he uh, he he met this coach, and he's going to say, he talk to the coach, and then about how work at a certain heart rate, and you will eventually get faster. So let me see if I can play this here, and then um, you can hear it. Just one second. Turn my audio up. And this is Mark Allen, the grip, six-time Ironman world champion. When I first started training, I was running hard all the time. I was trying to hit that five minute, five and a half minute pace in every run that I did. Finally, I saw that doing that did get me fitness, but that I was getting injured, I was getting burned out, and I was getting sick. Fortunately, I was introduced to a gentleman, Phil Maffetone, who was doing research on, on heart rate training at the time. And he said, when you train aerobically, you are stimulating your body to develop the enzymes that help you break down fat for fuel. The more of those that you have, the faster you can break down fat per minute. 
and you're going to get faster. So I started training that way. You know, the first few weeks, it was an eight and a half minute mile. And then it started to improve eight fifteen, eight minutes, seven forty five. I was getting faster at that same heart rate. At the end of about six weeks of this, I had a half Ironman distance race in Hawaii. I only did one speed work, swimming, cycling, running going into that event. And I crushed the rest of the field. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, this really works. Over time, doing a lot of aerobic training and the right amount of anaerobic work, I was able to run a five and a half minute mile at 155 beats a minute or less. That's what I want to help you to do. So this video, he's he's offering his coaching services as an Ironman University master coach. Uh, I bring this up because we have a, a running question coming up, but also with pacing on your swim and how someone who starts out right now, hey, they, they swim a two minute pace at a hundred, but with consistency, with the right type of coaching, they can get those paces down, the time down, but with the same effort. Can you expand on that for swimming? Yeah. So most people swimming seems to be what people are least experienced at as a multi-sport athlete and all the rules that apply to biking and running as far as how do you get faster it starts with frequency then you build duration and volume and then you add in the intensity as along with the strength training and so the strength training and swimming comes in the form of pulling with paddles or pulling without paddles but mostly upper body and so with swimming more than running and cycling, you do need to have that technique. I can usually diagnose someone's technique flaws based on their pace per hundred. Like if they're a two minute per hundred pacer or 140 or 230, I have a, I generally know what is causing them to not be making progress. So they need to be doing frequency is so important. And I think multi-sport athletes dislike swimming the most. And so they don't want to put in enough time in the water, but putting in time in the water, you just start to develop more of a feel and you start mm -hmm. to build, you start to build on that frequency, that consistency, and you start to just swimming low, low intensity. You start to work on your technique, your form with maybe some, some fast, maybe up to 25s or up to fifties as your maximal speed distance, because your form may break down if you do longer than that. But over time, you know, when you, when you kind of look at your fitness, your T pace by doing a one K time trial, mm -hmm. 1000 yards or meters. And let's say you're, you know, right now starting off your time is 20 minutes. Um, over time with consistency, frequency, stroke technique, strength, the proper intensity of your swim workouts where you're not just swimming at the same pace every time you swim, you're actually varying your pace. Then over time, you know, eight to 12 weeks, you repeat that 1K yard or meter test and you will be faster with less effort. Got it. Does yeah, that explain what you're wanting? Yeah, just kind of, yeah, punctuates what uh, Mark Allen was talking about with his his pacing and his heart rate and how he's yeah, consistent and, and the heart rate stayed the same. You know, there's a big thing right now. I mean, zone two training has been around. I mean, I've been doing this for over 30 years and I've always known about zone two training, but for some reason it's highlighted for, at least I think it's very much been highlighted the last few months in, in articles in research. And I think it's just highlighted, but it's, it's the same. You put in that base endurance of, following a certain rate of perceived effort or following a certain heart rate or power zone. And then over time you start to get faster in that same zone or you you're able to go further in that same zone. And that's a sign of fitness. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to, again, maximize your training by, by putting in that base foundation. There's, there's never been, there's never, nothing ever can go wrong with putting in that zone two training, that base fitness training. It allows you to develop all the enzymes and all the physiology that happens with that zone two training to make the higher training zones four and five and above easier. So if you were to run, I'm going to use this as an example that an athlete that I coached just did on his own he went out for a mile run as fast as he could. And he said, he's like, I'm not in that type of shape. 
and he did a six minute mile or 601. And I said, I know you're not in that type of shape. Just think if you put in three months of consistency, you're going to do that mile run at six minutes and it's going to be so much easier than it was today because you put mm -hmm. in the frequency and consistency and the volume and base endurance. And what you're talking about applies to all three disciplines too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This question from Cindy, how do you balance training at your pace versus training with your friends? And this example that she's giving is if you have a scheduled easy run and your easy run pace is eight minutes and your friend's easy run pace is 11 minutes, how often can you go slower than them and push yourself versus pushing yourself alone? That makes sense? Yeah, it does make sense. So again, I'm going to highlight the word easy. Easy is a feel. I think when anyone does an easy effort training session, no matter what the sport is, they need to go by feel. They don't need to follow a certain heart. Well, a cert, following a certain heart rate is actually good. You want to make sure you're in your zone one, zone two heart rate or your zone one, zone two power. But, but, but more than that, it's a feel. An easy run, ride, or swim should feel easy. It has nothing to do with pace or power. And so... I don't think you can necessarily go too easy if that's on your schedule, if the point of it is supposed to be easy recovery. And there's high fun value workouts that I like to incorporate into my training and athletes training where you, the high fun value is the ability to go out with your friends and not worry about any specific target that you're supposed to do for that day. So any group rides that I've I really do is only easy. I go out for a group ride or group run, or I'll meet someone in the pool, which I really don't. But if I did, it would be the primary purpose is social, fun. Let's do whatever we want to do. Let's not follow any structure other than let's go do whatever we want to do to have some fun. And so mm -hmm. how often can you do that? I think you can do that as often. I think you can do easy stuff as often as you as you want to, as long as it's high fun value and the 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 load or the duration is not extensive based on what's extensive for you. I can see that being really hard. I mean, even for myself, I think about, I know this is the, not the right mindset, but it's like almost a feel to me, my instinct says, because I'm competitive, that's a wasted workout, but I understand the benefits of the easy days, but I train, I want that training to be, have purpose. And the purpose clearly is to take it easy, to have fun. But with the A person type, a personalities of triathletes, it's like, do I really want to go waste one workout as a fun workout? Why don't I want to make it count and help me advance? But what you're saying is it does help you advance. Right. But if you're someone who you can only work out three days a week, you might not want one of those three days a week to be easy because you want to be able to do your, your long, your long days somewhat hard because it's longer. You want to be able to do that intensity day um, based on your fitness level. And then maybe you just want to go do your own easy day, um, not necessarily someone else's easy day. And so mm -hmm. again, context is important about the overall look and value of your plan and, and how much you currently are training and how much you can train. You don't want to necessarily skip a key high intensity workout to go for an easy workout with your friend. If you can still manage all your training and then on top of that, you're adding an easier, fun, high value social workout, then that's okay. Again, just keep a log and make sure you're not doing too much too soon and all that fun stuff. So it just really depends on the person and what they're training for and what kind of phase of training they're in. And you don't want to add all these easy days when you're trying to taper either. Mm -hmm. So you call this a fun, high value workout? Is that the, the, the term you're coining? Yes. Fun, high, high value fun, workout. High fun value. Oh, high fun value. High fun value workout. That's that's the total. That's what it means. That's a high fun value workout. Whether it's 100 hill repeats or 100 miles easy or 10 minutes easy, whatever is high fun value for you, you should you should do it. I like it. I've never heard that. Have you, have you heard that? Is that just something you've created? I've never heard that. It's, I love it. It's I've simple. only heard myself say it. And I said <laughs> it. I actually said it a couple months ago, um, to someone and I, I kind of, it kind of stuck with me. I'm like, Oh, I kind of yeah. like, I kind of like that terminology because that's kind of the basis of most of my training because mm -hmm. I like to train. It's never a, really a hardship for me 
you know, sometimes it is, but it's never something that I dread or it's never something that I have to do. It's always something that I get to do. And when I am specifically preparing for an event, I specifically try to follow more structure than I do when I'm not training for an event, but it's still high fun value. I like it. All right. This next question is a little bit of a long one, so I'm going to read it. So bear with me as we get through this one. This is from Sean. My current work and life schedule make it difficult for me to separate my two big runs, tempo run and long run each week. So I'm doing the tempo run interval work on Wednesday mornings and the long run on Thursday mornings. The issue is I am carrying fatigue from my tempo run when I get to the long run and it's affecting how I feel. I can do the long run, but is it more challenging? But it is more challenging than a typical long run for me simply because my legs and body are noticeably more tired than if I had a day or two of cross training between these two workouts. Question, can I expect my body to adapt to this training setup or should I make my work life changes that will allow me to separate the two key run sessions? This is from Sean. Okay, just this is packed full of comments that I'm gonna make. Um, number one, training plan should fit around your work life schedule. You shouldn't have to change your work life schedule to fit the training plan unless it's something easy for you to do. Like for me, I work from home, you know, so I'm, I'm, I have the ability to do that. So you definitely want to create the training plan to best fit around work and life. Sean is following our beginner. I think it's our beginner 70.3 plan. And something that I noticed is he's following it again. And so he's following at a different fitness level than when he followed it before. And he was terming this workout as a tempo workout when it wasn't. So I, I was clear to say, well, this workout that you're saying is a tempo workout, you're probably doing too hard because it's meant to be an endurance skills and drills workout. So he's not at that fitness level to be doing a tempo workout right now, followed by a long run. So I wanted to make that, you know, maybe his terminology was a little bit off. So I wanted to make that clear as well. And yes, you know, you, you, you should expect to adapt your body to adapt. I mean, I hate to expect anything. And so your body should adapt over time. A few suggestions that I gave to him was maybe flip flop. If he can do his long run on Wednesday and his tempo run on Thursday to see if that's any different. I like the fact that he's doing both of them in the morning. It's not like he's doing one Wednesday night and one Thursday morning. That's definitely going to limit the recovery time between runs. And when you are running, you know, two days in a row and you're not used to doing that, running is more injury, going to give, give you more injury potential than if you bike two days in a row or some two days in a row. So just make sure he's monitoring any aches and pains that are going on from running two days in, in a row when he's not used to that. And just, you know, keep a log, give it a few more weeks to see how his body is adapting. And it's okay to have to modify certain workouts, maybe, maybe put his, incorporate his tempo run into a different workout. Maybe he adds his tempo run as a brick run on the weekend off his bike, or maybe he adds a little bit more, maybe he has Wednesday for your recovery run and he adds some tempo efforts within his long run the next day. So there's kind of a lot of ways to juggle and try to get the adaptation and try to still get the intention of the workout. Got it. Got it. Well, I'm looking for somebody, something else here to bring in. Uh, for, oh, there it is. You mentioned a beginner 70.3 he's training for? Yeah. You know how he's, far away he's he is? He's using our beginner 70.3 program, which he used last year. He's using it again at, at a different fitness level. And do you know what Trace that is off the top of your head? Um, Chattanooga. He's training Chattanooga. for Chattanooga. And that's for 70.3? Yeah. And so that is on May 21st. Yeah. So at this point, he is about 12 weeks out. Almost 12 weeks out, according to my schedule here. Uh, this is one of the plans that we have on the Endurance Hour YouTube channel, at least uh, the, the previews of it. There's a, a swim, bike, and run course preview for this specific event. And this is a course that you've done before, right? Yes, Chattanooga. Yeah. So that one's coming up on May 21st. So good luck to Sean on that. And if you are having a, a race coming up soon, at the time of this recording, most everything is going to be more than 12 weeks out. And we've got some plans right now on the 
Training Peaks page under Coach Wendy Mater, where we're making some specific plans just for those events, which include a course preview so you know how to navigate and know what to expect on the run, the bike, and the swim. If you check that out, you can also see it on endurancehour.com. If you go to that and click on the Training Peaks or any one of the programs, you'll go to the page and see that. Oh, which reminds me, you give them a, an update on how much we have left on the triathlon training plan special for the 2023? Yes. Yeah, so um, if you go to endurancehour.com and click on a link to get a special code, and you can also get that code if you belong to our newsletter, all our training plans, all our triathlon training plans on Training Peaks are $99 or less with our special code. So if mm -hmm. you go to Training Peaks and you see the price, once you input our code, you will see the price goes down. The The Ironman prices are going to be $99. And then it gets less and less as the distance gets shorter. So Wendy Mater on Training Peaks, you'll see all the plans that we have. We're over 40 or 50 of them now, I think, overall, all of our plans, but the majority of them are triathlon plans. So whatever distance you want to do, take advantage of that and save money. And that plan is yours to keep for life. Reapply it if you want. And it expires March 31st. Right. That 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 discount of $99 or less expires in just about a month. One more question we have here, and this is from Jules. When I swim descending sets, I start to think that moving my arms faster isn't really efficient and isn't making me swim faster, even though I am breathing harder and tired. I'm still trying to figure out pace in the water. What am I doing wrong? Any thoughts? Can you first define descending sets? Yes. So when, when I create sets of a descending set, let's say um, three 100s descend one through three, number one is easy, number two is moderate, number three is fast. So you're trying to go faster as you can eat consecutive 100. Number two is faster than number one, number three is faster than number two. And as a beginner swimmer, a, a lot of swimmers who are just starting out or who don't have the fitness, they tell me they have one speed. No matter what they try to do, they have one speed. And so she is correct. Some The way to go faster is to increase your arm turnover. And like I said in the beginning of the podcast, swimming is a technique strength sport. If you don't have the technique to develop the strength, and you try to move your arms faster to go faster and you're not, then you need to backtrack and work on technique and strength. Technique comes first, then you build the strength, and then you try to increase your arm turnover without losing technique and strength and you will go faster. And so I've done a few videos actually on the Endurance Hour YouTube about stroke rate. And again, going back to using paddles and how to increase your strength. And then how do you get faster? So I'll link those um, videos in the description talks Excellent. more about that in depth. Okay. Oh, and also, yeah. also like swolf. If, if you wear a Garmin, Garmin will get your swolf score. And that's just a little bit about what is your time based on what is your stroke rate. And you can just by using the Garmin and looking at the, that data, you can find out for yourself, what is the um, efficient stroke rate for you to maximize your time based on your effort. And then we've also talked about swimming golf on this uh, channel where you can actually do a set where you're, you're moving your arms really fast, adding your stroke count to your time, and then you move your arms really slow, add your stroke count to your time, see what's less, see what addition is less, and that's more efficient. I like it. You know, that's all the questions we have for this episode. Is there any other topics that um, we need to bring up or feedback that you're getting from athletes or topics? Well, I have some topics. We've a little discussion in our T2 Endurance Facebook group. Go ahead. Every month, I've, I mean, it's only February, but in January, the focus was getting athletes to do an iron distance triathlon during the month of January. In the month of February, the topics that I've been posting have been based on flexibility, mobility, and strength. So it's kind of like been the educational topic of the month. Next month is National Nutrition Month. So every year in March, um, I bring up topics related to nutrition, fueling, 
um, pre, during, and post training or any nutritional questions. Cause there's a lot out there. It can be really confusing. And so the Facebook group is just a, a way to reach a lot of athletes with educational content that we've already created on the endurance, our YouTube channel, or it prompts me to maybe write an article, a blog, or create a video to answer someone else's question. And when you post it in the group, it not only helps that one person, but it helps other athletes as well. Very good. Hey, by the way, that training plans uh, link on endurancehour.com, it's just on the top of the page. Once you go there, it'll take you to, if you see the word training plans, on the top of our page, you'll see home, about us, training plans, and so on, the discount code, newsletter sign up, and so on. Just by clicking the training plans, you'll go directly to the page on Training Peaks. So you don't have to really search. You're like, oh, where do I, how do I spell Mater? You know, uh, Wendy Mater, where do, how do I find that? Just go to endurancehour.com and all the information is right there to find all the plans. Just to clarify. Okay. Well, with that, we nailed it. We got a podcast in. Sorry for the uh, the break last week. I was out of town and couldn't uh, make the podcast, but we should be back on schedule for the foreseeable future. And any uh, special plans for you this coming week? I don't have a swim meet, and that makes me oh. really happy. I've been, you know, I'm kind of, you know, January, February weekends are filled with swim meets, and we just had our state championship this past weekend. We have one more meet for the short course season, the Northern Divisional Championship, which is at the end of March. So I get to enjoy the next few weekends, um, continuing our house renovation um, and just kind of being home and training on the weekends. And that's about it. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, we, we just happened to, we, we had a, a big cold spell that went over here. We were, I think it was high of nine yesterday and snow came in and now it's just super cold the kids were asking me the sun's out but why hasn't the, the snow melted i said well it's when it's 10 11 degrees it's hard for that big ball of fire to melt the snow out here but, <sighs> that's cold it's about 70 here today as you can see i'm in a tank top <laughs> yes yeah now we have a what's it a high a high of 12 well a high of 19 today but it's windy um so that's going to make it feel even colder once you step outside just what does it say the wind chill factor would be? Currently, it's 11. <laughs> oh, high is 17 now. Wow. But the wind makes it worse. Oh, well. Anyhow, okay, there you go. Uh, check out the Endurance Hour YouTube channel for the latest content there, along with um, endurancehour.com for the, the newsletter signups. You can get some discount codes as well as an update on our recap of the podcast this week. And for Wendy Mater, I'm Dave Erickson. Have a great week of training, racing, or recovery. We'll see you next time. Adios. Adios. Mm -hmm.